Hickman. I'm a nerd. I love Jesus and Stranger Things. Uh, I, you know, the stories that speak to us the most typically encounter us at our mo moments of deepest pain and personal suffering. And I've often said when trying to describe Stranger Things to others that if someone knew me on a heart level, on a soul level, they would create a story just like Stranger Things, just for me. Because it's kind of like my crack cocaine. You know, I've only seen the first and second seasons maybe seven times a piece all the way through. I know that's, I have issues. Hi. My name's Lee Hickman and I'm an addict. Uh, a little, and, and Matt told me, told me, or advised to, to, uh, to meet you as a shared sufferer. First, I'd like to thank Matt McGill for giving me this opportunity and Andy Euler for volunteering me for this. Uh, I'm just so thrilled to be here. I go to Living X Church and I love what y'all are doing here at Mockingbird. Um, but Matt encouraged me, said, meet them as a shared sufferer. So I thought in order to, uh, for you to understand why I love Stranger Things so much, you might need to know a little bit about me. Uh, I have, I'm an identical twin sister. I'm the evil twin. Okay? I'm seven minutes older than my identical twin sister. And being a twin sister is great. It's also terrible. Uh, because you're constantly being compared to another person. And people are always trying to figure out, how do I tell you distinctly apart from your carbon copy, right? Uh, so it started early in my childhood, you know, um, kids would come up to me and say, I know how to tell you two apart. I know it, Lauren is her name. I know the difference between Lauren and Lee. And I went, oh boy, <laughs> what is it? They said, well, you're, you're more of the tomboy and she's the girly girl. And I went, okay. <laughs> you know? And then as we got, got er, older, you know, like preteen, teenagers, it was, um, you're, you're the more mannish and she's the pretty one. Yeah. I had a guy once, his name was Jimmy, Jimmy Lucas, I'll never forget that. Jimmy Lucas asked me to ask my sister, sister if she was amenable to go on a date with him. And uh, I said, why are you asking me to you know, set you up with my sister? And he said, well, uh, your sister, you know, she's not much in the way of looks, but she's all we've got. And I'm an identical twin sister. So, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> okay, so. What I'm saying is the reason I'm going into detail, not to make you feel very, very sorry for me, but um, I've just kind of grown up feeling like I didn't quite fit in. I felt kind of like I've never been like one of the accepted girls on the team, right? And um, I've gone through a lot of personal rejection, specifically from intimate friends, okay? So much so that when my functional savior, a guy named John, dumped me in 2007, and he was, I would have told you, check the box, it was Jesus Christ, but John was my savior. When he rejected me, I gained about 70 pounds medicating with food. Uh, I cut myself. I didn't bathe for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I got heavily addicted to pornography. Because if my God didn't care about me anymore, if God didn't love me, and by God I mean John Turnage, uh, uh, then uh, I had no real value. And I was, and since God didn't love me anymore, uh, I didn't take care of myself. So, fast forward, and where is Stranger Things and all this? Well, then Stranger Things happens. The Lord lets me see a story about people who are confronted with the reality that their normal everyday nothing happens in Hawkins life is is intimately interwoven with a supernatural reality that they they don't no longer have the option 
of just ignoring anymore. In order to literally survive in the context of the story of Stranger Things, you have to take the supernatural seriously. And in order to take the supernatural seriously, you have to bond as a group and create a community that looks very strange. If you've seen Joyce Byers, she's a freak. I mean, she's literally sitting in her living room with an ax, a la The Shining, waiting to put a hole in the wall at the first sign that Will is speaking to her, her lost son. And that shared freakiness of belief unites characters. I want to show you the trailer for this first season. I know that some of you, most of you have seen it. I just want to see, I love watching trailers, you know? Can, can we watch a trailer real quick? Okay. Something is coming. Something hungry for blood. What is it? The oh. Demogorgon! What oh. a deep shit. <laughs> Oh. Later. See you tomorrow. Good night, ladies. Kiss your mom night for me. Will is is missing. I don't know where he is. 99 out of 100 times, kid goes missing. The kid is with a parent or a relative. What about the other time? What? You said 99 out of 100. What about the other time? The one. The one. Wow! Wow! Guys, I really think we should turn back. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> That's not Will. You're in trouble, aren't you? We've sealed off this area. This is where it came from? Yes. And the girl? She can't have gone far. Find her. Do you really think it was a coincidence that we found her at the same place where Will disappeared? Something is going on here! She knows about Will. Is there any way that you could reach him? Yes. Nancy! Go, go, go! What if this whole time I've been looking for Will? I've been chasing after something else. Okay, I'm one, one big human chill bump right now. On July 15th, 2016, the Duffer Brothers Netflix premiered Stranger Things. The tagline to the first season is nothing is stranger than believing. Something is going on here, Joyce says. Maybe this whole time Hop says, I've been searching for Will, I've really been chasing after something else. Maybe in our day-to-day -day lives, what we think we're seeking in the stuff we're seeking is one thing, but what we're really looking for is something stranger. I'll quote C.S. Lewis so you guys will know I'm legit. Because <laughs> I won't be otherwise. He says, C.S. Lewis, I've read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and C.S. Lewis. And it's, he says, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. C.S. Lewis is saying, there's stuff in life, there's an itch like, th that I can't scratch. Like David was talking about, there's an itch that I can't quite get to. I can, if I'm, when I'm hungry, I can eat. When I'm tired, I can sleep. When I want sex, I can have sex. And when I want friendship, I can go hang out with friends. And yet, deep inside of me, there's this ache for this satisfaction I can't 
find here. Like the great U2, U2 song, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Stranger Things has often been uh, linked to a, a line in Hamlet, since I teach literature, if I don't quote this, then I'm out of a job. <laughs> Hamlet says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And all the things that you see around you, what you taste, see, hear, there's something more. So Stranger Things comes along. And I thought, how in the world do I talk about Stranger Things? Because honestly, uh, I took notes on the first episode of the first season. It took me 12 hours. I'm not exaggerating. We could just do the first episode. The whole thing is very rich uh, and very uh, deep. I don't think that the Duffer brothers intend there to be any Judeo-Christian haunting in their series. Can I just be clear with that? I, as far as for what I've read from them, they're, they're sweet Jewish boys. Uh, but uh, there doesn't seem to be any knowledge of Christ. Okay? But uh, I'm, I'm comforted in this, and I want to plant my discussion in this, because in the Bible, and this gives me real legitimacy, in Ecclesiastes 3.11, the author writes, He has made everything beautiful and it's in its time, also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And I love that because that means whether you know Jesus or not as your Lord and Savior, eternity is still written in your heart, hence, ergo, the ache. The, the need to scratch an itch, but not knowing where to find the relief. And yet, what I love about Ecclesiastes 3.11, well, a lot of people will harp on eternity is written on our, in our heart. But he also says, yet so that he cannot, that is us, he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's almost like a biblical promise that you will never be completely sovereign. You'll never know fully the, the extent of what God is up to in your own story or in the lives of others. And yet the adventure of life is to seek it out. Right? Ergo, hop on a bike, watch Stranger Things. So, knowing that the Duffer brothers and the actors in the show have eternity written on their heart, I take comfort in this because they can't help but reflect the greatest story ever told. And the reason that when this series was streamed internationally, it was the most streamed show internationally in the history of stream, streaming. The reason why that is, is, be is because it hits, a, it hits a cultural nerve and people are like, well, it's just, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, reminiscent nostalgia from, uh, you know, uh, Steven Spielberg films and 80s culture. And I just kind of want to go, really? Is it just that? Maybe. But that's not why I watch it. Sure, you can see E.T. references and Jaws re references and all kinds of references in it. But at the heart of the story, there's a story about a boy who ironically is lost. Where have I heard that before? Hmm. He's a boy that's lost. In fact, let's just, let's just look at the first scene. Scene one, season one, opens with the night sky. It's a shot of the night sky panning down to earth. It's the Department of Energy. The Hawkins Lab is a, is a part of the U.S. Department of Energy. Immediately, the U.S. Department of Energy is juxtaposed with another kind of energy. Our government saviors are not the savior. A door opens rapidly. You see a guy running hell-mell through a door afraid for his life. Lights are flickering off and on. He's shoving his finger into the button of the elevator. He can't get the door open fast enough. You know he's doomed from the moment you see him. He's, he's dead. And it's almost like this button that he's pushing, this, this technology that he's heretofore trusted in for salvation, 
doesn't work anymore. And then as he's trying to get away, he looks up, and, it's, and the first victim, the first, the first scene, is an at attack from above. Something literally grabs him and pulls him up. The attack comes from above. There's a world that's bigger than you that you cannot con control. Then you hear Mike intoning. Mike, by the way, Mike Wheeler's my favorite character in Stranger Things. Cards on the table. Mike says, something is coming. It's almost prophetic. Something is coming. Something hungry for blood. A shadow grows on the wall behind you, swallowing you in darkness. It is almost here. Will asks, what is it? Which kind of reminds me of another horror movie that came out recently. Right? What is it? It's this nameless thing that's coming for you. Mike says... The Demogorgon is tired of your silly human bickering. When this thing happens, when this thing comes, your little petty arguments are going to look very petty. When you're confronted with ultimate reality, what you trusted in as your salvation, whether it be po politics or your knowledge of culture or your pe petty arguments about which denomination has it most together are gonna look really silly. Okay. Anyway, um, throughout the show, interestingly enough, I was just, I was noticing this the other day Characters are often given or give themselves a title that stands in as a kind of a doppelganger or a kind of, of label that they will have to overcome to reveal their true character. Um, the boys, uh, Mike, Lucas, and Dustin, are all given titles by their bullies, uh, bully friends at, at high school guys that are committed to making their life a living hell. Do uh, you know what they are? Interesting. Uh, the boys look at them and they say, yeah, they say, you're midnight, talking to Lucas. Of course, Lucas is the token black kid in the show. Midnight, looking at Mike, frog face, and Dustin is toothless. Okay. Interestingly enough, the name Lucas means bringer of light. You know. Also, midnight is a time that is a shift between two things. And we know from, if you've seen the show, Lucas definitely has a shift in character from very skeptic, the one that's hardest to convince of the truth of what's going on in Hawkins, to a person who really believes and is helpful. In fact, he's the storyteller in season two, if you remember. You've got frog face, which sounds mean, you know? You shouldn't say that to my favorite character, Mike. However, that's a, that's a sign of who he is, too. That should make you think of a fairy tale, right? Frog prince? What happened to him? He got kissed by a princess and turned into a real prince. The moment that Mike meets Eleven, he starts to become the prince he was always designed to be. So a name that was a bullying name is actually an a, a, a indicator of his princehood. And Dustin, of course, is toothless. He's got cleidocranial dysplasia. The actor, Gaden Matarazzo, actually has this condition. I think that's just beautiful that he gets to be uh, in this show and kind of highlight this genetic thing. And uh, he says he's toothless. When the boys are picking, picking on Dustin, Mike, always reversing curses in the show, looks at Dustin and he goes, I think that's kind of cool what you can do. Dustin has no joints in his neck so he can move his arms in and be kind of freaky, right? He says, I think that's kind of cool. I think it's kind of like you have superpowers, like Mr. Fantastic. You're like an X-Men or a Fantastic Four. He's taking something that would be conceived as a curse, toothless, and turning it into a blessing. 
you've got superpowers. To which Dustin says, yeah, but I can't fight evil with it. He's got this <laughs> longing to fight evil, very innate need in a person, especially a young man, to contend with something truly evil and win. You know, Dustin literally means valiant warrior. So that's for fun. All right? Well, we've got, a, we've got some things going on. Jonathan is making breakfast for his mother in the first scene that you see him in Stranger Things. The moment that you see Joyce, she's looking for something. Not her son, her keys. Y'all remember that? So where is it? Jonathan says, have you checked the couch? She says, yes, I did, I did, I did. Well, look again, Mom. So she looks again in the couch, and guess what? She finds her keys. In the same episode... She's, the same scene repeats. This time, it's with Will. Will has gone missing. Hop comes into her house. He says, maybe, maybe he came home. He had a key. Maybe you should look inside your house. He's, she says, don't you know? I haven't checked my own. You, you don't think I've checked my own house? He says, well, it's, it's a place to start. And ironically, where does Will make contact? At the house. So you've got these two images of seeking, and he's, it's right, what you're seeking is right where you are. Right? Ooh. <laughs> That's strange, right? But in order to find your friend, you know, the boys, Mike and Lucas and Dustin, they go out in the woods. They've been told by Hop, don't investigate, don't do anything, don't go out looking for your friend, leave, it, leave the investigating up to me, I will find him. And Mike, who can't stay still, who can't stay on the bit bench, God bless him, goes out in the woods with Dustin and... His, his, and, Luke, and Lucas to find Will. Going into the woods, by the way, is a motif. It's a fairy tale mo motif. Everybody who's looking for anything in a fairy tale goes in the woods to find it. It's even so popular they made a musical about it, right? <laughs> I mean, good gosh. If you're going to find something, go into the woods to find it. Go on a quest to find it. Dustin says, says I, I think this is, you know, and, 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 and Mike is, Mike's defying Hop, the, the police chief, to go out into the woods. Dustin says, I think this is a stupid idea. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to rain. We should turn back now. We don't, even, we don't even have any weapons. And at the moment that Mike is taking the step of faith to find his friend... At the very moment Dustin says, we don't have a weapon, you know what they find? L. L. Now that's a weapon. Right? They find the ultimate weapon. He takes a step of faith. And Joyce, in a conversation with Jonathan, right after she's, she's lost all hope of finding, finding her son, they just found, her, found his bike, he's likely dead, or missing, she tells Jonathan, he's close. I feel it, I feel it in my heart. You've gotta trust me on this. What language does that sound like? We've heard that before too. It's almost the language of, of someone trying to convince another person just to believe in their heart that something's true. You've gotta trust me on this. Do you know what happens next? Well, that's the scene where Will calls the house. At the moment of each character's faith, expression of Evett, Mike going into the woods, or Joyce saying to Jonathan, he's close, I feel it, is the moment that Will makes contact in the house, in the day-to-day. -day. What's, the, what's, the, what's the sign that Will's presence is close, y'all should know this. It was in the trailer. 
What, but it's not just lights. What kind of lights? That's Christmas lights. It's a light we use, we put it up, put it up at Christmas time to celebrate Christmas, the incarnation, the coming of our Savior into an upside down world to make it upside right again. To make everything that was broken whole. So it's fitting, right? When you see the Christmas lights flashing, that that would be the sign. That that would be the, the, the signal. Now you've got to believe the Christmas lights are flashing. And by the way, nobody in here, I don't think anybody in here since I've started speaking has really thought about the lights in this building. You know why you haven't thought about them? Because they work. I promise you if there's a power outage and they start flickering on and off, you suddenly become aware of the preciousness of the light, right? It's like a distortion in the light makes the light more precious. That could be a thesis for Stranger Things. People are always like, man, it's so dark, and like there are kids in danger, and it's just a real dark show, and it's so scary. I'm like, but isn't the light precious? As long as the Christmas lights keep blinking, the Christmas lights keep blinking, there's hope. Hands down, my favorite line, maybe in the whole show, is when they find, find Will's bike. I'm going to keep track of time. You know what happens? Hop. Hop finds his, finds his bike, bike, and of course that's a bad sign. A kid without a bike, he's in trouble. And one of the other stooge cops in the show turns to Hop and he goes, it's a rhetorical question. He goes, do you think he was hurt in the fall? <laughs> and I just about fell out at that point. I went, you're kidding me. We're literally using that word to describe what happened to Will. Wait, first of all, we referred to him as the lost boy. Now he was maybe hurt in the fall. You see how this reappropriation of the language that we usually speak in our Christian circles and denominations is like the flickering of lights. When we, when we have it, when we speak of it amongst ourselves, it can kind of become trite. Of course, there are lost people. There are pe the fall was a big deal. It broke everything about creation, and it broke our hearts, and it broke God's heart. And we kind of take it for granted. But then a show comes along and reappropriates that language and all of a sudden the devastation, the horror of someone who is lost in need of being found hits us freshly in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid and I know doesn't hit me as hard as it should. Because I want to live in that story, you know? I want to be Mike Wheeler when I grow up. I want to go save a friend. I want to go, go on a quest to help people that were hurt in the fall. Wait, I'm on that journey. I'm in that story. The strangest thing is believing. Hop, when we meet him, Hop, the police chief Hopper, you know what is, what's, what's up with him is he, he's, a, he's asleep. Presumably he's had a bad weekend and maybe drank too many beers and he's asleep on a couch. He's been asleep and we know immediately when he wakes up and looks at his watch, he's been asleep too long. He looks at his watch, oh no. He gets in his shower, his shower is laughably small for him. He doesn't fit in his house. He's been asleep too long, and he's living in a story in a house that's too small for him. Why? Because that's true of all of us. We've been asleep, and we've been asleep too long. And we're living 
in houses too small because we were created for a story that's much, much, much bigger. Wake up. Because people are really lost. And people like me have really been hurt in the fall. That was the first episode. <laughs> You should really see the whole show. Any questions? Thoughts on the show? Yeah. First of all, this is fantastic and like maybe my favorite thing I've heard at a Mockingbird conference ever. Um, it's so good. It's so good. I would just love for you to like talk about Eleven. I don't know why. I just like I just want to hear what you think about her and sort of how you view her in this narrative. And okay, great, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my God. Okay, her name's Eleven. Her name's Eleven, right? Her name's Eleven. I told you that characters change based on their names. That their names are often a sign of where they're going, right? Well, Eleven has been a lab rat her whole life. In fact, in one of the saddest scenes, that's also one of the funniest scenes in the, in the show, in, when, when Mike hands her clothes for the first time because she's wet in a storm, she tries to take off her wet shirt in front of the boys. You know, and they make this huge, like, oh my gosh, you know, as they rightly should. Do you know what that scene reveals about her? She's never known what it's like to have your dignity recognized and respected. Ba on a most basic level, on the level of nakedness. You just don't want to get naked in front of other people. It's a boundary. And she's doing it in front of boys. And you know what that means? She's done that all of her life. Her name, Eleven, it's tattooed a la, very similar to like a, a Nazi trans tr concentration camp. When Mike interacts with her for the first time, this is so sweet, he touch, He goes, I've never seen a kid with a tattoo before. Wow, is that real? He touches it and she flinches, she backs away. Mike's immediate response is, and one of the great reasons I love him, he goes, oh, I'm sorry. I've just never seen that before. It's the first time somebody has ever apologized for touching her in a way she doesn't want to be touched. It's the first time somebody's respected her boundaries and apologized. And you know what he says next? God, I've got one big chill bump. I know what he says next. He says, that's who you're, 11? That's your name? Well, I'm Mike. It's short for Michael. We can call you L, short for 11. You know why that's interesting? Because it's a short, shorthand for Elohim, for a name of God. He's for the first time recognized her boundaries, and he's recognized, no, you bear the image of Christ in you. And, the, and this, this sign that was going to be a sign of your slavery and your dehumanization, shoof, is now a sign that you're not a slave, you belong to him and you bear his name. Thank you for the question. <laughs> nice. We can have an altar call up here, you can get saved, yeah. I'm confused, I've, I've watched those with my son, mm -hmm. yeah, younger son, and I, I thought the evil was manufactured by the company. Is it supernatural or is it manufactured? Oh, Both. Know. Both. Yes. Yeah, Stranger Things has a lot of skepticism towards government as a savior. Part, that's part of the reason why it works on us as a culture is we live in a time where we don't trust government very well, very much, okay? And we trust it more than we should. And at we the trust same time. it more than we should, yeah? Right? As our savior. Right? But there's also a real component. In their manufacture of danger, in their child abuse of 11, they've accidentally opened the gate between another world and our world. And that other world is dark and dangerous. Will says up to his mom, he's like, it's like the, the world, it's like this world, but it's dark and it's so cold. 
So cold, Mom, hurry. Oh, and I like that term, turn upside down. So in our attempts to fix the world in our own earthly power, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But, but, get, but the government has inadvertently op has, has opened a wall. By the way, it's almost like, if you've seen season two, it's almost like something has been ripped open, like a wall between the worlds, and it needs to be fixed. It's almost like um, something's been rent, or something's been literally broken that has to be healed for there to be, in order, in order to save Will in, in season two, you have to reverse the fall. You have to heal what's been broken. And that's the only way that he can work to work salvation. And by the way, if all the characters aren't doing what they're doing, like if, if Mike's not doing what he's supposed to do, if Dustin's not doing what he's supposed to do, then there is no salvation. No, no one character is the hero of Stranger Things. It's the body of Christ working together that accomplishes the saving of Will Byers. Yeah. Yeah, I just had a, a, a question. You pointed out something about the producers and the writers about they're good Jewish guys. They don't really know anything about Christ or anything. What is it kind of at a higher level? I'm, you know, it's just fascinating to me that you can watch a movie or read a book that has no roots in kind of biblical, but there's a story there. There's the gospel. I mean, I've, I've sat and watched Black Hawk Down, and the last scene is like, that's, that's the gospel. Mm -hmm. I've just walked into that soccer stadium or... Another movie I saw recently, just the way, way back, just where I'm like, oh, my. I mean, I watch that movie every time I cry. What is it about story and the gospel? And it's just bigger than what I ever imagined. That's my question. Thank you. Eternity is written on our heart. We can't help but write into our stories, the biggest hopes, the biggest aches, the biggest story we hope is true. And, and Romans 1 gives us a, a, a clue, I think, to your question, that, that there's something in man that knows the truth and denies it that we can look at the glory of God and still go to created things. And yet, we've repressed the truth in our unrighteousness, which means to repress something, you've got to know it's there. So people think, well, we're, I just, I'm just blindly ignorant. The Bible says you're not. So you write, you write stories, you create TV, you write plays like Thornton Wilder, and you reflect ultimate reality because as an image bearer of God, you can't help but to. Wow. Yes.